welcome to this, another episode of Frame and Reference. I'm your host, Kenny McMillan, and you're listening to episode 97 with Matthew Jensen, ASC, DP of Extrapolations, as well as films like Wonder Woman 1 and 2 and The Mandalorian. Enjoy. Have you been Have you been watching anything? Are you on a gig right now? Is that what brings you out to Massachusetts? Yeah, I'm shooting. Yeah. I'm shooting. I'm doing a, a small movie out here. Gotcha. And so that nor the I assume that means you haven't been able to watch very much recently. Not a ton. Not a ton. Um just research for the movie, basically. Um so I'm not completely current on um a lot of what's been released or going on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was the what where where was your leaving off point? Uh let's see. I think uh kind of what it hit the zeitgeist was the last of us. Oh, okay. Um, and, um, uh, yeah. Uh, n- you know, news about the flash, um, and, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, all, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, to be fair, everyone's answers for the past month or two has just been last of us in succession. So you're not, yeah, you're not too far out. Yeah, my wife is a huge Succession fan, so she was uh, she was telling me about it. I've managed to kind of see a, a few episodes, um, but it has never really uh, grabbed me in the way that I know that it, it's grabbed other people. So I um, I watched the whole thing, and then I went like, "All right, that was interesting. Like, it's it's a great show, but it's yeah, Last of Us or like Andor were the ones that I was just like." very excited about for all the nerd shit i guess <laughs> <laughs> right right no andor is great i i i really i think that well first of all tony gilroy is a genius and yeah. he yeah you know he made michael clayton and michael clayton is one of my favorite movies and it's gotten better with age totally um it's kind of this underrated masterpiece i think it doesn't get enough props um but uh i really think that andor is the way that star wars should go um Mm. and um i think it would win over a lot more fans and um and have more staying power and in terms of you know for adults and and things like that and you know i and i say this because i spent a little time in the star wars world um you know Essentially, I know that it was always about, you know, what governments do and how they transform and change. And, and, um, so, and it all comes out of kind of Lucas's, you know, activism in the sixties, you know, that sort of, that sort of mindset that he and Coppola and all those guys were in. And, uh, I think if the, the film sort of forgot about what's, you know the 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 lore of the past and what it's been in the past, and focus on it as more of a metaphor for our culture. Um, it would be a lot lot more interesting. Yeah, I, I you know it's funny. I I was uh, I actually get to interview. Uh, like we're gonna hang up in an hour and some change, and I'm gonna have like thirty minutes to reset, and then I interview Adriano who shot. Oh right. Andor. Oh great. So yeah. If you have any questions, uh, formulate right. them. I'll yeah. Ask at the end. I, I will. Uh, but um, I for years I was always like, they just need to make a movie. Like I want to know, or like a show. Like I want to know what Law and Order looks like on Coruscant. Like I want to know what the on the ground people yeah. are doing. And then and then Andor came out. I was like, that's fucking close enough. I mean, that's the- yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's the the nuts and the nuts and bolts and the people who aren't royalty or jedis or you know a lineage of of you know elites it's uh it's much more interesting how how does the and the empire seems so much more scary and oppressive in tony gilroy's kind of versions yeah um than you know d- just kind of these buffoonish you know bad guys in you know in black and yeah. Red. yeah. So. Well, um, yeah. I mean, I I will I'll give credit to uh, what's his face, Favreau, and and um, 
the other guy because they're the other guy all the stars Dave, fans Dave Filoni. Filoni, yeah yeah, yeah. um just because like that you know Filoni's basically continuing his cartoon in real life which is cool in its own right i mean you're given the opportunity you might as well take it but i i yeah. agree it is it is more like a cartoon on that so what is this kids movie and anything but um I'll talk to Adriano about that. Again, formulate some questions. I'll ask him. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but um, you did bring up uh, uh, Coppola and Lucas and them. And I actually grew up in the Bay Area and learning more and more about them uh, made me want to become a filmmaker because it felt more accessible from that front. But mm -hmm. obviously doing a little research on you, it sounds like you uh, kind of had the same uh, bug as i did where it's just like ah, i just kind of want to film things and make it cool but then you also went to usc like those guys <laughs> right yeah how did uh, uh how did the sc world kind of uh, affect you um most of the people i well, know are from new york for some reason oh that's interesting uh well sc ultimately was a was a really good experience for me um and, uh, you know, I was there at a time when, uh, everything was still on film and we were cutting on film and, um, uh, you know, we were shooting 16 millimeter and haggling for equipment and, um, mm -hmm. and, um, and SC had so many connections to working professionals. Um, I got exposure to uh a lot of people and you know they would just come in and they would show their movies there was one class in particular where they would they would bring in a guest and they would show their movie and we would see a 35 millimeter print of it in a great theater and then we would go back to a small classroom with like you know 10 to 12 kids in a round table and we would sit and talk with whoever that guest was and we we got some stellar people like you know, Conrad Hall and right. John Schwartzman and uh, even Goldblatt and those three DPs. But then also John Turturro came in. Um, he had directed a movie called Mac uh, in the early 90s and um, uh, Norman Jewison and, you know, just like some some heavyweights. And your teacher um, was uh, Woody Omens, eh? Yeah, Woody, Woody was spectacular and very supportive and helpful particularly to me and um you know he was a i think he was a real get by the school <laughs> um because he his career was kind of winding down he would still leave on occasion to do movies um uh, especially if eddie murphy called him he was sort of eddie's go-to guy and um coming to america and all that yeah and uh and uh, yeah, Woody was just I, Woody was just a, a really upbeat, very positive um, person and very supportive. And um, just and he was able to bring in uh, you know guests from that he knew from the ASC, and we would do workshops with them, and um, where we would be the crew, uh, and you know like Conrad Hall. Jeez. get a scene for us and like we were conrad's crew and um that was mind-blowing and um you know I, I i look back on it very fondly i i think when i was you know 18 19 20 i, I had a, there were a lot of issues i had with the school but i, I don't remember what they were right. <laughs> anymore so, uh, I think we all did with all of our universities. Yeah, exactly. Because it, it, it somehow it did not live up to, you know, the hype that somehow it was going to instantly transform and change your life. And, um, and you know, it, it can't, it, you know, it can't do that. But the great thing about it is that I was exposed to a lot. Um, I had an opportunity to make movies. Um, I met a lot of great people there who um, either became some of my best friends to this day or, you know, are also working in the business and are successful. And we all, all of our collective success has, you know, sort of propelled us through the industry. And, um, 
and I got to make a lot of mistakes and ultimately they, you know, it's just a student film, you know, so uh, there's no cost to the, to the mistakes really. So, um, uh, so I learned a lot and, and, and the greatest thing that I could say is that I shot on film the entire time and I, I got to expose film and know the labs and know the equipment. And, uh, I had quite a leg up by the time that I got out of school. Yeah. I, uh, now you've, one thing you'll, you'll notice by the end of this discussion is, uh, my brain will constantly fork out. So we're just going to go with the first one, which is, oh, uh, yeah. I love got, the forks. Uh, great. Uh, I've got, uh, hundreds of, uh, C magazines. So whenever I have a guest, I'm able to research. <laughs> so, um, so I got your, uh, wonder oh. one, one here, uh-huh. uh, and to your point about shooting film, uh, it sounds like when you guys were working on that one, uh, that you pretty much shot on everything. You had a 65, you had a regular Alexa, you had a bunch of film. Um, and I was wondering if you could kind of speak to, um, obviously we all love film and in, in the, uh, article, Patty Jenkins talks about how much she loves film and how it, how it, um, can only render, uh, the image in a certain way. But then in the same article, you're quoted as saying like, oh, between the Alexa and film, you'd be hard pressed to tell the difference. Um, so I was kind of wondering what your opinion is, especially now being five years removed from that. Um, what the, not what the point, cause I love film as well. I learned on 16 as well. So I have, it has a special place in my heart, but, yeah. um, kind of what, uh, obviously for practical reasons, you shoot Alexa, but what, you know, what's, what's the, what's the difference there in your head? Like at this point, would you just say, ah, screw it, let's shoot Alexa. Cause it's more practical or is there still film in your head that, um, what are the advantages of either? I would say it's a right. great wait, 40 minute question. <laughs> uh, got it. Um, well, it's, it's really a, it's really a very lengthy and nuanced discussion. Um, Perfect for this podcast. I, I, yeah, I think I think both mediums are completely legitimate and have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, um, the great thing about film is that it's tactile. I love the smell of emulsion. You know, power I like bait. it. Smells like power bait. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I love the. You know, I love that you know, you thread it through a magazine and that it's a mechanical process and a photochemical process. And, um, there is something that I love about shooting film because in terms of your rhythm on set, the way that, you know, you have to have a mag change after 12 minutes or, and, um, there's a little lull and then you get back up and go, there's a, there's an ebb and flow to thing. There's, um, you know, once the camera starts rolling, there's a sense of like, we got to be on our a-, a game because this horror that's happening is expensive, you know? And, um, so there's, I think a greater attention to detail, um, when you're on a film set. Um, I love not being tethered to a monitor. I love to be able to just plunk down the camera and look through the lens and start lighting and it's in my head and my knowledge of the film stock and um nobody else really knows what's what it's going to look like except for me um and um uh i love that kind of control and also the feeling of like i don't need all these electronics and cables and tethers and i it's just me and my light meter and looking through the lens and you know that's what I'm, what I'm doing. I, I would say that it does, it, it, overall, it affects just how you run. Um, so, um, and there is a psychological thing that happens when you see the dailies a day later and, um, um, I always go in in the mornings before set so very early you know 4 35 in the morning and just work with the color timer and 
just setting a couple of looks. Um, they've had my, I've taken stills on, on set and I've done a basic grade on them through Lightroom or something and sent them as reference. Um, and, and they're kind of, and then generally the dailies colorist is in the ballpark, but then I go and I tweak it for a second and then I see the dailies and it's my time, uh, with the, with the movie and nobody else has seen the dailies yet. And there is always a, a, a lift that comes, a boost that comes with seeing the work um, a day removed. And um, um, I'm, I'm generally on a high going into the next day that I just don't quite get in the digital workflow. Mm. Um, and, and, uh, I don't know why that is. And maybe it's because I've been watching the monitor all day. Uh, and I got, you know, I know what it looks like. Um, Surprising. so yeah, exactly. Um, and so, uh, I really love that aspect of film and, uh, in terms of image quality, I mean, it, I think it's, it's mostly a textural thing. You know, you're work, you've got the grain and there's hal halation and, you know, and, and so there's a, a different feel to the film than a, a, an ultra clean digital signal. But in terms of like depth of field and the way the lens, it lenses render, I mean, all that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's, it's all, I don't know that I see a huge difference there. And, um, there is, I, I still think that film is kinder on faces. Um, and I think it's because of the way that the, um, the film is layered, uh, in terms of the colors, you know, that, you know, the red and the green and the blue and the, you know, or the cyan, magenta, yellow, you know, the, the layers of the layers of the film and, um, uh, combined with the grain and, uh, all the inherent characteristics of a, a film image, I, I think, you know, it, it just, it's, it's gentler. Um, yeah. uh, less resolution, less what people would say K's, you know, to a degree. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I think the resolution thing is, I, I find a little limiting and, fr and frustrating Deriv or uh, reductive. It, yeah, I, it just doesn't, ultimately it doesn't, um, describe the, the, the image, you know, and I think right. you see that in terms of how airy has developed their, their, uh, sensors, um, where they have, they have felt like color is a primary, the primary driver of, of the image, you know? And so, um, but on the yeah, other like side attention. of it. Yes, absolutely. And I, look, I mean, I'm using the new Alexa uh, right now, the Alexa 35, and it is stunning in terms of it, it its imagery and um, uh, and you know what you can do at 3200 ISO is just like my God, you know, it's unbelievable, and it's not that noisy, and um, and the and the color is is just spectacular and um and you can work with a lot more saturated colors i find on digital because uh, just because of the the difference in the sensor it's you know i i found that in film like if i put a, a a half straw gel on a tungsten lamp i always felt like that was a lot but right. if i do that on a d digital sensor i'm still I'm still like putting on more and more, you know, making the, making the, uh, you know, the, the sky panel warmer and warmer, and warmer to, to get what I, I feel like I used to get very easily. I could push color into film much more easily. Um, so, um, and I think that has its advantages because, it, you know, you can shoot in a lot of environments where you can't control the lighting. And you don't have the same kind of problems that you used to on film. Like I can easily go into a supermarket and shoot with the overhead fluorescence and then hand to the windows. And the the difference between the, you know, the daylight looking magenta and the fluorescence looking green is not as 
egregious as uh, I found them that, you know, when I was sh shooting primarily film where, you know, I would want to go and replace all the, all the fluorescence, or I would only want to shoot towards the fluorescence and then in another setup shoot towards the windows. So I, I could control that. And, um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, but, and for a low budget, I, I, I really love digital. It, it, I, I find that I do less in terms of lighting. I can use less equipment. Um, uh, my power needs are smaller. Um, uh, so, you know, there, there are a lot of trade-offs. I mean, if you, you listen to Steve Yedlin, I, you know, he, He's name dropped him too many times. I swear to God, he's, yeah. he's avoiding me now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Steve is, I, Steve is highly technical and, you know, very, um, some sort of genius when it comes to all of this. And he makes a lot of good arguments about, you know, the, the capture, he's sort of agnostic about the capture medium. Um, what's interesting about his approach though, is, you know, at, at at the 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 end result is that everybody wants it to get, look, look like film. Mm -hmm. So you're 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 still still your standard is what we of a good looking image is what we know from a film a, a film based image, and that's that's I think that kind of boils down the argument to something very simple. It's like everybody wants it to look like film. Why don't you just shoot film? Well, and uh, another thing to your point about like uh, gelling out lights or swapping bulbs or whatever is I've noticed um, because film seems to have that inherent, uh, as you were saying, like um, emotional change on set, people are more on or whatever, sort of a, a, a gravitas, if you will, if you get to say you were shooting film, a lot of younger creators or newer creators I've noticed lean into those artifacts. You know, they want to shoot. 16 super 16 instead of 35 or you know no one's shooting imax in college but um right because you know that's too clean and so yeah. they won't gel everything they'll leave it green because it those artifacts yeah. you know that heavier grain eight millimeter shows that they're shooting film and they get to be like look at me you can tell it's film off rip instead of right affecting it later in post or whatever right absolutely and and there's kind of a an authenticity that comes with that it seems um yeah i'm i'm a real filmmaker i'm shooting film <laughs> right well what's funny is you couldn't get away with those same i see that a lot you know in music videos especially you know like oh just kind of un you know uh lab scan one light uh smaller film stock left as is but you would never get away with that with exception in like the regular film world where they're trying to go cleaner and cleaner and cleaner yeah only to get muddied up and post again <laughs> To, yeah. to the to a specific degree this time yeah absolutely absolutely um yeah and i mean i think at the end of the day uh, because the, the real problem in shooting film is the lack of lab support um there are there are very few labs worldwide now um there used to be you know hundreds and um uh, so many of them have closed. And um, if you're not in one of the major hubs, you're near one of the major hubs, um, uh, you don't have the support. So it's easier to set up, uh, you know, a kind of remote dailies station. And, you know, we're the film I'm doing now, I mean, we're doing a very simple workflow where I have no DIP and I have no dailies colorist. It, it's simply... Um, we spent some time developing some LUTs and, um, that LUT is, um, just applied to the dailies and, you know, that all the footage gets uploaded by an assistant editor to a, to a portal and, you know, everybody views it that way. Um, so it's very simple and it's also very disconcerting to me to get dailies at lunch from the morning <laughs> right. that you just shot. And it's like, wait, I, this can't be right. I haven't approved mentally processed. <laughs> processed <it. laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I look, I, I think that, um, 
you know, in regards to, I think, your original question about film, I, I, something that we discovered on Wonder Woman is that we, in our testing, we shot some action sequences and um, um, shot film and shot Alexa and then intercut them. And we got Patty and me and Zack Snyder and Debbie Snyder and Chuck Rovin and everybody in the room and showed it and no, and the fast cuts, nobody could spot it. Right. So, you know, it, it's once there's a little evening out in post and, and also it's digital projection, you know? So that's, that's also the great sort of unifier in all of this. Um, I, I would be really curious to view something shot in 35 millimeter projected in 35 millimeter against something shot digitally projected digitally and really see side by side so what the, what the comparisons are i not that i'm going to be remember this very well but when the matrix came out for its 20th anniversary i saw it you know it was like the re the I, I guess you would call it the Blu-ray version, um, but it was like remastered. Uh, I think Bill Pope did his like okay on it, and then almost immediately after they showed it at the New Bev, and I got to see it in there. And it and it's the nice thing about the digital one from my perspective was that like I had been watching this movie on DVD this whole time on a you know modest television, and there were just little details that I could tell in the big one that, uh, and I think this goes back to your point about being nicer to skin tones and or skin and stuff but um little things that i didn't notice when i was watching it in the big digital projection and i was like oh crap there's like little things in there and there's like i was just pointing stuff out and then when i saw it in film it just felt different like it it felt like the matrix you know which is a right. silly thing that not like it felt like we were in the matrix but like the movie you know it felt like the movie that i remembered um so there is kind of an amorphous uh intangible to it yeah yeah, I, uh, and I, I think some of that, you know, what Quint Quentin Tarantino says about digital projection is just watching TV in public, right? I and you know it's a typical sort of Tarantino comment, but like he's you know he's got a point, you yeah. know the public but, part's important, but <laughs> yeah, exactly, and and I just hope that that doesn't get further and further lost, but um. You know, the uh, the funny thing is, is I remember I saw Dunkirk in 70 millimeter mm. film and uh, the flicker was so intense. Uh, we've gotten so used to seeing these kind of perfect digital, you know, projecting projected images with no, no weave, no gate weave and um, no flicker or anything. I was like, wow, I. We used to, was it like this in the past? Right. You know, I, this is really intense. Um, so I, I, I was really unprepared for my reaction to it. And I mean, you know, the colors are stunning and there's something, uh, you know, there is something, you know, like you were saying, a grab a gravitas to it. Um, you know, the new Beverly showed just recently, um, uh, a Technicolor uh, IB print of The Godfather Part Two, and oh, wow. I wanted, to, and it was sold out all three nights. Sure. Before I, before I'd even blinked, it, it was sold out, and it was great to know that, you know, that there's still a demand for that kind of thing. But, um, you know, to see that movie the way that Gordon Willis had intended it, what I would it must have been a thrill and. Uh, having no memory of seeing an IB print, you know, um, and I've seen a lot of, I, I think in film school, I saw a lot of classics, very good prints, but I don't think anything as stunning as that. And, um, you know, Willis used to sort of back in the, uh, back in the eighties was lamenting the, the, the state of labs and I think oh, wow. what it what had happened is that after the Godfather Two Technicolor 
had shut down uh, the IB printing process. And so he, he didn't have as much control. Ironically, in the digital age, we have all this control. But back then it was, you know, a series of film matrices and, you know, he could really control the blacks and, you know, the saturation and uh, all these kinds of things through the printing process. And um, so it's just funny how these things kind of ebb and flow. Yeah. Well, and what's fun, <laughs> I love when this works out. Uh, that was the first fork. <laughs> the second fork was uh, learning under or, you know, working so to speak in film school with people like Gordon Willis or, or Conrad Hall or whoever. Um, what are some things that maybe, uh, you, you pulled from that, that you still keep to this day that, you know, maybe pop in your mind as you're working on the set you're working on today? Yeah, I, I think, um, well, I, I was lucky enough to, uh, I shot a, a movie, a small movie called man of the century. This was 1997 it was black and white. Uh, on film and you know, Batman forever. <laughs> um, and uh, I, uh, I, I was lucky enough to the lab connected me to Gordon, and I, I, I spent two very lengthy phone calls with him, and he was so generous with his time. It was, I think, it was two two-hour conversations. Oh, good. Heavens. Um, yeah, and he was just drop of knowledge um and uh because i was having some issues with the lab and the and in my test and um you know gordon's inf gordon's information was so specific on how to sort of root out what the problem was and he gave me a series of tests to do and um i followed them to the letter and I was able to, you know, catch the lab in its mistake and, um, uh, and everything played out exactly as he said, he said now, okay, so this is what's going to happen They're They're going to deny it. And then they're going to rush and, and back to you and say, okay, we changed all the chemicals in the, in the bath and we started printing it at a different light. And, and he's just like, you know, they just don't know what they're doing. So right. you you might want to go to this lab or that lab and talk to them. And and everything played out to the letter. And I still take that, you know, how to test, how to um, work with a lab, how to communicate with a lab. All of those were very practical um, things. And I, I think that that's um, the beauty of working with guys like, him who you know they were not only artists but they were technicians and they had methods and uh quantifiable ways that you could um um just practice your craft and they and 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 it was almost like doing a you know a workout or, or stretching routine to get ready for you know you know, the Super Bowl or something like that. They just, you know, they, they just, they had methods that were exacting. And then, you know, with, with, with Conrad in the workshop that we did with him. And then uh, I had a couple of conversations with him afterwards. Um, and something that I will say, and sort of a life lesson that I learned from both of them and then several other DP, you know, DPs that I knew at the time who were very generous with their time and they there was a sense of that this knowledge had to be passed down right. and that you wanted to bring um the younger generation up in in um in a in a way that um where they were they understood that it was a craft and that it was acquired and accrued knowledge and um and so i've tried to do that with just give you know, give back a little bit and some mentorship things and, and answering questions and, you know, being accessible in in that regard, because they were extremely accessible to me. But, um, but then jumping back to sort of a technique that, 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 that Conrad would do, I, 
um, and I tried this for a while. I, I don't really do it much, but every once in a while it comes up is like, uh, he was lighting and, you know, he would put all his, and these are all Fresnel tungsten lamps. He would put all of them on spot. And I was like, spot, really? That's normally you, you flood them all out to get a nice even beam. And, but he was putting them on spot and then bouncing them. Like he would bounce like three weenies in the mirrors and kind of send the, in the set, send the light all in different directions. And they would be overexposed by three stops. And, um, and he called his ambience room tone and he would put some muslin or on the floor and he would bounce light into the floor and he would just get the barest amount of light in the room and he would shoot wide open, you know, at one nine or something like that, <laughs> which was crazy to me on film. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and the results were so stunning. You know, I, I think that he, I, nobody really likes like him. He had such a, particularly later in his career, he had such a unique style and it was hard light and everybody had morphed into soft light at that point, you know, big sources and, um, cutting them and, you know, shaping them. And, but, um, but he was almost like a, you know, a pointillist paper, uh, painter. Um, and, um, so his technique was fascinating, fascinating to watch. Um, and it still kind of blows my mind that he was able to see that, um, and, and work the way that he did. Uh, those guys, those guys in particular, I, I think were innovators. Yeah. Um, and, um, I think a lot's been written about that generation of cinematographers who uh, were coming out of the 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 '60s and into the '70s, and they made um, a real mark on American cinema. After you know, they were influenced by Europe, and the technology was changing, and it was also a great time for American movies. And um, they just they weren't doing things in a traditional manner, but yet still had the craft to back it up. Yeah, that that. <clears throat> Pardon me. That mirror thing is starting to uh, kind of have a resurgence with the uh, the light bridge stuff, the CRLS stuff. And I just got to talk to Jacob at Cinegear. Have you have you uh, used that at all? That no, I technique? haven't. I mean, it, enough of my, I suppose, peers are just fascinated by the idea, but um, it's not even hard to get a hold of. Matthew sells them. I think just most people don't. Uh, you know, you got to test it a bunch first, which I'm hoping I can, but. Um, was the do you know if the mirror thing was just to get the light further away to try to get it a little more natural looking was that the yeah yeah to get a harder light basically um and when he was in a small small set um if he couldn't really back off his lights um yeah he was doing that and also the mirror did kind of funky things to the light it wasn't a perfect beam you know mm. um and uh i think he liked the texture that it that it picked up so yeah. um uh it kind of it i just remembered um going back to the other fork uh about um wonder woman but watching that film a gorgeous film great job uh but it you. definitely has uh what i would call that kind of zack snyderness about it um mm -hmm. and i was wondering how much obviously he had some influence he produced the damn thing but uh how much influence does he have on the look? Because you know you'll you'll watch something like um, Army of Dark, no, not Army of Darkness, Army of the Dead, and that looks very much like Hammer, you know, three hundred or whatever things that he kind of really had his hands on. And then Wonder Woman, which is unique but still feels that way. And I had seen that you in that same article uh, were shooting film but had like a gentle correction filter on it to not fully bring it from daylight to tungsten or however you want to think about that um yeah how much of that look is just inherent in film and he shoots a lot of film or how much was that di well um first of all zach uh was um 
you know, was around, but he was, he left and, you know, he left most of the movie to Patty and I assume so, yeah. basically he's, he was very supportive. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, Patty and I felt like we couldn't, you know, there was a world that he had set up and so we weren't going to completely right, right, right. get out of it, you know? And so I forgot, um, I forgot he made the whole DCEU. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Get- you know, there's, you know, whatever there's, some fans love it, some fans hate it, whatever. And, you know, now it's something else, but, um, um, yeah, I mean, you know, essentially Wonder Woman, you know, Wonder Woman shows up and, um, and Batman versus Superman, which is so funny. I, I, a little seg, we, I think we shot that, we started that movie in 2015 and we, we shot, it was a lengthy schedule. It was like over a hundred days. And, um, we started in November of, oh God, I can't remember, October, November of 2015. And we shot for like a month and then we had Christmas break or something like that. And, um, and so I went back home to LA from London and um I went to a movie with my wife and um uh, the trailer for Batman versus Superman came on and it's the one where Wonder Woman shows up in the in the trailer mm. and it was a packed house I think I you know it was one of the Star Wars w- w- was on and we were seeing that and so it was like a kind of a raucous atmosphere right. But Wonder Woman shows up in the trailer and the crowd goes crazy. (laughs) And we were in a, you know, we were a month into shooting and I I was just like, oh my God, (laughs) we might be onto something. (laughs) Right. That like, you can feel like, and it was all, and it was a lot of women. Like they were just screaming like crazy. And um, it's like, oh, uh, we might be, we might be hitting the the zeitgeist right now. So th- there was a, at that moment, there was a real sense of excitement. Like when we got back from the new year, I was like, okay, hey, this is going to be hey. great. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be great. So, uh, and then we just had to deliver it. But in regards to the look, um, yeah, I mean, look, we, you know, there was a lot of technique that I think that we kind of borrowed or mirrored from Zach's work, a lot of slow motion. Sure. Um, that's in the movie, um, is very much in line with what Zach was doing. We tried to make it our own, but, um, uh, it, you know, it was all in that, that kind of realm. And, um, uh, you know, Zach's, um, second unit director, um, uh, was Damon Carroll was on our, on our film. So, he was he was helping us with a lot of the action sequences and so i think it was kind of natural that there was some there was some crossover there and then um and you know uh, patty likes high contrast and so really rich blacks and you know that's kind of zach's thing and so we felt like our natural pro- proclivities were kind of taking us in that world anyway and that um you know, and, and and in regards to the kind of the the color grade, particularly uh, there was a story point to having the kind of icy blue exteriors that you saw in the European section of the of the film because it, we really wanted to contrast this kind of warm, lush, uh, uh, you know, greens and uh, and you know, bronzy skin tones of Themyscira with this modern gray industrialized cold london you know the world of man and that had to we wanted to give a strong visual contrast so that's what kind of led us in and to those decisions and then you know i i think and you know we used a lot of you know we knew stefan sonnenfeld colored the movie who is um you know pioneered one of the best uh, the, <laughs> the look of 300 basically with zach and larry song um you know stefan had an instrumental you know sort of influence on on that and he's he's an amazing colorist and so you know i i just think we were we were all kind of in the same line so i i think you see more of a departure in wonder woman 84 um yeah 
Totally. So, uh, you know, the, the franchise was more patties at that point. So we did some things differently. Yeah. I got to, uh, briefly meet her at the, uh, Kodak awards, which was pretty cool. Oh yeah. That was a, that was a fun event. Everyone going up and just like, it, it did get me stoked for film again. Like I have a fridge full of film. I still shoot film photography and I was like, yeah, yeah fuck everyone else. We're doing this forever. <laughs> like, you know. Absolutely. Uh, oh, you know, Janice Kaminsky, we're just standing around and someone looks over and goes, is that fucking Janice Kaminsky? And I was like, uh, yep. Yep, that's him. He goes, you know, got to meet the guitarist from Queens of the Stone Age. A lot of people there that were fun. Wow, what a random event. Yeah, I, I know. It was uh, it was uh, Troy Van Leeuwen for anyone who, but I go up to him and I'm like, hey, man, uh, just wanted to say I'm, uh, you know, a big fan, but I'll leave you alone. And he goes, well, I'm a big fan of you. And I was like, oh, okay. And he goes, how was that? And I was like, that's fine, man. I get it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm leaving. <laughs> He was, I could tell he was kidding, but in the back of my head, I'm like, fuck, he probably gets approached because he's a very distinct looking man. So it was like, yeah. he just gets it every, every five seconds. Can't get away from it. Um, yeah. but, uh, kind of pivoting over to, uh, extrapolation. Mm -hmm. is, this, is there an S on the end? Extrapolation. There is. Yeah. Cause it's an anthology kind of thing. Um, have you, have you ever seen or heard of the game Detroit become human? No. I highly recommend, I don't know if you're a video game person, you have to buy a PlayStation for this or maybe watch some videos or something because your episode of Extrapolations very closely, not mimic, it has the same vibe as that video game because that video game is all, it's, it's, I, I would be very hard to explain succinctly because uh, in that game you play um, an android uh, like and androids are kind like they look very human. They even have the little thing in their temple, except it's a circle, not a bar. Um, and it's just, even like the look of it. It's it's very. I highly recommend you look it up. But okay. uh, but extrapolations. Weirdly enough, didn't see any ads for it or anything. But it's a fantastic. It's got every movie star in the world in it. <laughs> it seems, yeah. Uh, and amazing. You know, everything's great. How did you get that gig? You know, where is it just like, oh yeah, you shot a bunch of dope shit. Let's get you in here. Or was there kind of uh, one of those, uh, you know, someone who knows someone and you're in? No, I mean, uh, and you know, for the record, I only shot the first two episodes um, of Extrapolation. So, um, oh, you didn't shoot. Yeah, Wait, and were did IMDb lie to me? Uh, I don't I know. I, I, I I shot the pilot and uh, episode two. Uh, okay. Well, I watched the wrong episode. Oh, I watched uh, the one. There were a lot of a lot of other DPs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I know, but oh, fuck, maybe I was just supposed to. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Bad research. But in any case, pilot in the second episode. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I. Uh, I didn't know anybody um, there, and it came all came to my my agent, and um, you know, and I had been interested in um, just uh, doing something that was, um, <clears throat> you know, le had less action, was not you know, kind of the genre uh, stuff that I had been doing, so. Um, and I was really excited to work with Scott Burns and I, you know, Contagion is one of my favorites and, um, uh, and certainly like, you know, uh, we became obsessed with it during, uh, the pandemic. So, um, yeah. And the scripts were fantastic. And so I was really interested in, 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 in doing it. And, um, and the great thing is that I worked with, you know, not only Scott Burns, but Philip Messina and Gregory Jacobs, all of who, you know, kind of worked with Steven Soderbergh for, you know, over a decade and they all were, had worked together. And, you know, so I kind of latched onto their collective knowledge of, um, uh, you know, how to make something like this and, it got a lot of stories about how Steven works. And, um, so that was all fascinating. And, 
um, and I love Stephen Stephen's work. So um, I, uh, yeah, it was it, it was it was just kind of one of those things that was sort of a no brainer for me because um, um, it was two episodes of you know really high end television with really accomplished people. Um, so and and the subject matter is devastating, and I thought it was important to be a part of. Yeah, it's uh, I've mentioned before. I I, I looked it up. It's uh, Eagle Burl that I or how do you pronounce his name? Eagle Eagle Eagle. So I was yeah. supposed to interview him first before you. So I watched his episode first, and then I saw Extrapolations again. And went yep, saw that, and so that's he, where the confusion was. But got it. He, I need to tell him to play Detroit. Uh, yeah. But it, in either way, like I've I've mentioned a bunch of times, um, you know, I, I've been a snowboarder my whole life, and and so uh, um. The environment has been at the forefront of, of my head basically forever. Um, and seeing a realistic but non pandery anthology series. Like it's it's not preachy. It's like this, yeah, these are all things that can and will happen if we don't flip this around. I thought was a uh and also making it kind of cool and sci fi and like interesting. I thought was it was a great um great idea and then everyone did an amazing job well thank you um yeah i, I mean there were a lot has not been missing <laughs> all yeah, of the shows are good no that's yeah that's good to hear that's good to hear um yeah i mean look it was a great experience it's a hard it's it's really a hard uh thing to to pull off you know that kind of sci-fi uh in in that format um you know where you're you're realistically trying to say what's going to happen you know so, sort of science back um you know we had a lot of discussions with you know futurists who were saying where technology is going and uh and also scientists about you know where the, the where the climate is going and that was that was the hardest thing was for us as a as a sort of design collective was coming up with how the technology was going to advance um and um you know what what we thought was possible and even even the smartest minds that we had access to there's there's still a lot of guessing so you know um and i think ultimately that's kind of the message of the the show is that these are possible futures you know right. this is this is what could happen it doesn't mean that this will happen um so um uh yeah i i and um it, it was interesting to be Im immersed in all of that sure with it being an anthology type thing still interconnected to a degree but kind of individual stories did you guys have to kind of sync up what the show was supposed to look like were there references for that or was everyone kind of given their own thing yeah, and that was another reason why it was so appealing is that the look did not have to continue from episode to episode. Um, it was um, each director, DP team could do their own thing, essentially. Um, we were working with the same equipment. I, I kind of chose, you know, the the, the lenses and the, and the gear and, you know, from the beginning and then, you know, different teams sort of took over and um, the crew stayed consistent while the, while the DPs and the directors and the ADs changed. Mm. So, um, what'd you uh, choose? Uh, the Alexa LF, um, Panaspeeds uh, as our glass. Um, and, um, yeah, what, I think that was the camera package. And then, you know, I, and of course, different lighting styles and, and the crew sort of brought in it was a lot of led based lighting sure um which makes sense though so, um um yeah what were yeah. the uh what were the sort of references and and inspirations for your episodes because i imagine everyone else was kind of looking at what you were doing especially if you're shooting the pilot you know they're gonna lean a little bit yeah, but uh, yeah i don't know if anybody did but um <laughs> yeah it's uh it, it's funny uh well certainly for the second episode which was whale fall and it's uh sienna miller plays a scientist and she has the technology to to speak to the the last remaining 
whale. Um, and um, then touched on in Lola. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Because her son is then carries on in that episode. Um, uh, the 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 biggest influence was the movie Arrival. Um, um, Denis, Denis Villeneuve's uh, movie. And um, once we got into it a little further, I realized how mu- how they really are kind of cousins. Um, and uh, you're dealing with loss and grief and uh, a woman uh, d- dealing in this kind of proscenium with this otherworldly creature. Um, and they have this, um, you know, exchange of, Kind of what makes what makes people human, and and how do you deal with grief, basically? Um, and um, uh, I'm not, you know, the look is not really Brad similar. <laughs> yeah, um, I I love Bradford's work. I just don't. Uh, he, he's he's really an amazing cinematographer. I just don't. I'm not as bold as as Bradford in in the choices that I make. So. Um, um, so yeah, that is certainly, that was, that was a big influence. Um, and then, um, for the pilot, I, I actually think contagion was probably had, was kind of looming large over the, um, uh, multiple overlapping storylines and, um, kind of different, um, um, uh, sort of environmental um situations where you know kind of dictated the look of every city um Mm -hmm. so we we spent a lot of time talking about well there are fires in tel aviv and what would the fires look like here as opposed to in new york where they also have fires and um but it's farther away and so there were some subtle color differences but we we definitely wanted to feel the sort of patina of um of the haze and then we you know we just come out of the wildfires of in la and um uh, so we had a lot of and now you're living in fucking boston or wherever yeah i know exactly i don't have his no, dash on, on my car um well i i think the the real life events influenced the look you know i uh um, sure. so uh we had all this photo reference and even my own photo reference on my iphone of taking pictures of my car in the morning like under the orange sun with the with the particulate you know ash on on my car on my black car you know like really standing out so right. um uh so we, we were we were biasing all the sort of urban environments in, in a particular way and then we had some arctic environments that we you know treated differently so um um and you know because of the multiple storylines it, it sort of ended up doing that kind of traffic thing where each storyline was kind of color coded um so um and and that was very much scott's idea of how to you know kind of link all these stories together so yeah um that was fun yeah on on a, on a, any tv show but i imagine this one was no different uh obviously you're moving quickly uh, especially if you got a crap ton of different locations and stuff um in what ways were you able to maximize like your efficiency and uh speed on set um which i, I mean it feels like a very high budget thing but any television that is usually relatively low but uh given you know whatever constraints you you had yeah i yeah it was you know we had a lot the vision was sort of much and this happens a lot to everything but the vision is much grander than what we could actually achieve so there were a lot of cheats and visual effects help um and there was a lot of discussion about what visual effects could and couldn't do um and in terms of maximizing efficiency i think a lot of it was Scott and I just being on the same page as to what we were going to shoot and what day and when. And we went to locations several times and took photos and uh, blocked out the scenes. And, you know, I had my Artemis app and we, you know, we made a little collection of photos 
and said, you know, these are our setups. And um, and particularly, we were we were shooting in Queens at a, a museum um, and uh, that we were treating as a convention center, and it was a big space, and so we had to know exactly where we were looking when, in order for me to. I, and I had some, you know, pretty extensive lighting rigs and, and things. And so, um, in order to even get through our day, I just, we just had to know exactly what we were doing. So, um, and you know, actually th that kind of prep is my favorite thing about making a movie is, or sure. a TV show or whatever is, is that time spent in prep with the director, um, at the location working the blocking out, um, making a shot list. To me, that's where the, the creating, the really heavy creative work is done. You're considering all your options there and winnowing it down into what's achievable. Uh, and then the, 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 the crunch of the day focuses it even more. Um, so, well, you don't need that shot. Um, so Adam Savage calls it, uh, hacking decisions or hacking limbs off your decision tree. The crunch yeah. does <laughs> it makes things That's very accurate. It does. It does. Um, and it's, it's funny ha how it happens. Like somehow until you get into that pressure situation, you know, you, you've got like two or three options and you're like, Oh, I, I could use that shot. And then you get into it and it starts to unfold. And, you know, then it's, it's only that pressure that creates that, that like I don't need that I don't need that that ripping out of the the shot list so yeah. um which somehow you can never get to in the prep phase <laughs> do you uh, do you find that uh it was did it take a while for you to kind of build the knowledge of when you're ripping those pages out uh how to not do that because it's easy and how to know that you don't need the shot does that make sense that's not a, I might not have formulated that question correctly, but yeah, I, no, I, I, I sort of get what you're going at. Um, I think that's a debate I always have. I always have. And, um, uh, there is so much time pressure, but, um, and there is, uh, there is always that you just got to move on. You just got to move on. And sometimes it's not about moving on. Sometimes it's about digging in. Mm. and saying we need one more take and we need one more shot um we're gonna do it in a fast manner but in order for the sequence to really work we 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 need to drill down and we need to say and then and then on the other end of it you have to you know you have to know when to to cut your losses and um um i i think that's just something that comes with experience and um seeing how the scene unfolds um in front of you um and you can do all the prep in the world um but when it comes to life it generally is something a little different and um you have to think on your feet you have to be responsive and very present in order to decide then what's what's essential um Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, and I, and I'm still baffled by it. I'm still, it's still like agonizing sure. at times to, to make those calls. Well, and, and also, uh, I subscribe to the slow is smooth, smooth is fast thing. And, uh, I was interviewing, I don't know what episode it's going to be. I've done like a hundred interviews in the past couple weeks. Um, but, uh, he was saying that, you know, the, the era of the shouty, DP and director trying to whip everyone into shape is kind of over. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that's obviously it's for the best, but I imagine that stress levels were higher because of that, making people go slower. Whereas if you can calmly say, all right, we need this next shot. Yes. We're going to go over time a little bit, but like, it's going to be fine. We're all fine. Let's just do it. And like right. that will actually end up going quicker. Yes. Because people aren't making yeah. mistakes or whatever, you know, they're, they're collected and focused, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It's, um, uh, yeah, I have not been on a lot of shouty sets in a long time. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's been a while. Um, 
and I've never found that I never found that those were conducive to to good work. No. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I and not not to say that things don't get stressful or I don't snap every once in a while at an AD for telling me to hurry up, you know. <laughs> so um, uh, it's a different conversation. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But um, no, I, I look. I, I think it's about um, you know it's, uh, something that I I be that I've realized is a huge part of my job and um, where there's a lot of growth is is in the leadership aspect of it. And um, you know, uh, now that I'm kind of an older person on set, I'm no longer. It's weird. I you know I I was one of the younger DPs. Uh, for many years and then all of a sudden I turned around and oh now I'm older than a lot of people that are on set I don't know how that happened but um, you know I, I see I, there are you know kids in their 20s you know coming up through the camera department and in you know the uh, the electricians and in the grip department and um, you know when I was doing some of those jobs when I came up I just remember being tense and ups, you know, on edge all day, not only because I didn't want to screw up, but because somebody was always about re ready to lecture me or bite my head off, you know? Right. And, um, uh, I just did a very small movie last year in Los Angeles and we had a lot of crew members who were, had just gotten into the union or, you know, and not very experienced and, um, uh, you know, both my gaffer and my key grip and, and I all wanted, um, them to have a pleasant experience. You know, it was an opportunity for them to learn. And we tried to take on the role of being teachers. Um, and sometimes we didn't get the results that we wanted, but it was, it was about a learning process. And I, and I think that that's important. And, um, um, I wish I had had that kind of, I, I was very well trained, but it was always kind of a, you know, a sort of an uptight affair. And I think that created a certain amount of def defensiveness mm. as, I, as I got older, um, you know, it, I, I was quick to say, well, I didn't do that, you know? Um, right. and, and, uh, not practicing extreme ownership. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And um, uh, now I think I'm much more comfortable and the environments are much more comfortable with it to, to, you know, even for me to say, look, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't judge that correctly. I, I made a mistake, but, you know, we still need to do this. So, you know, let's all calmly have a conversation and get this next shot. And because it'll take us longer to talk about it than it will be to do it, you know. So, um, um, uh, yeah, I don't know if I really answered no, that and I sort of went off on my own tangent there, but, it, um, the tangent man, man, <laughs> uh, you know, speaking of learning, um, on, on, uh, extrapolations, you know, obviously every project you learn something, is there anything you learned shooting those two films that you've, uh, carried on to, two short, whatever you want to call them episodes <laughs> that you've, uh, carried on into this next film you're working on? Well, yeah, I mean, every, every job's a, a learning experience and, um, um, yeah, I, let's see. Well, first and foremost, like I'm, I'm using, uh, the, this movie I'm doing in Massachusetts, I'm using, I'm using some of the crew that I met in New York. So, um, on, on one very, you know, basic level, I've, I've made, I've formulated some new relationships. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, you know, and it's nice to be working with them again. And, um, so, and there's an easy communication. Um, so that's, that's always great. I, I do love going to new, new cities and meeting new crew people. And, uh, you know, now because you shoot, you don't just shoot what movies in Los Angeles, you shoot them all over the world and all over the United States. And you're not always, I'm not always able to bring my, my longtime crew with me. So I have to pick up new people and, and I, I like that process. So I feel in that, in that way, um, it, it's also learning how to become a better communicator to new people. So, um, uh, in terms of, um, I just, in, 
in terms of craft, I think um, um, I'm I've I've become obsessed with blocking, and um, and although that is primarily a director's job, I I've, I've realized that it is also my responsibility especially when I'm working with directors who, you know, are former writers or, you know, come from editing and, or, or, you know, don't have the onset experience helping them use the camera to, um, uh, not only tell the story, but then to move their actors and how they can change positions and, uh, and your shot side changes with their motion. Um, and, um, and that's, it's a delicate thing you got to work out with both the actors and the directors because some actors don't like to be told from the DP, right? You know where to go, and so you have to kind of talk to the to the director and say, "Hey, maybe this," and you got to do it in the right manner. It's all very subtle kind of politics in in, in a way. But then other actors love, the, you know, the the camera people saying, "Hey, could you stand over there because that you look better over here," and you know. Right. Um, or, or if you stand here, I don't have to do another shot of you, uh, and and we can get out of here sooner. And and, and, uh, and there are those actors that go, great, great. Yeah. I'll stand. I'll I'll put me anywhere. If we don't have to do another shot, I'm I'm really happy. So, um, you know, and and I, I think not only is the the blocking a, a real art form in it, in it, and but it's also this it it, it helps with efficiency. Um, totally. And, um, and it, and then it all ties back into craft. So, um, uh, yeah. And I, I, and, and particularly with extrapolations, I had, I had a, a really collaborative relationship with Scott Burns, you know, in, in doing a lot of that. And, um, I, I've, I've learned with somebody like Scott, um, who is brilliant and does a lot of research and, um, but he wants a lot of input from his creative team. And, uh, my job was not to say it should be this, but to, to give him a multitude of options. And if he had an idea, then I would just run with it and present my, you know, do some research, do a test, present findings, show him, Hey, it could be this. Do you like this? So whether, whether it was from a lens or a look or, you know, something in the color or, you know, an angle on a building or, you know, that kind of thing. So. Totally. You know, the, the blocking thing reminds me, uh, there's, you know, masterclass, the like series. I hate yes. that they called it that because now you can say, oh, someone did a masterclass and you have to be like, like on the ASC or like the master, cl- the capital M. Right. Yeah. But, uh, the Ron Howard one, he does like, it's like a four hour section where he blocks a whole scene out from one of his films with like new actors and everything. And they like do the lighting. They, you know, make a pocket for sound, the whole thing. It's very fascinating. Very educational. Yeah. I, I'd like to see that. Um, okay, yeah. Guest I, pass. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Please. They, they keep emailing me about these guest pass. I'm like, I don't know who the hell wants these. <laughs> oh, good. I'll take it. I'll take awesome. It. Um, well, we, we've got a little bit over time, so I'll, I'll, I'll let you go. Cause I know you probably got stuff to do. Um, and actually the, normally the last two questions I ask, uh, you've pretty much already answered. So we can just oh, wow. leave it there. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for, uh, uh, sticking with me. And, uh, that was a fantastic conversation. Love to have you back. Talk about whatever you're shooting now, or just if you want to shoot the shit. <laughs> Sounds great. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Kenny. I appreciate it. Frame and Reference is an Owlbot production. It's produced and edited by me, Kenny McMillan, and distributed by Pro Video Coalition. As this is an independently funded podcast, we rely on support from listeners like you. So if you'd like to help, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash frame and ref pod. We really appreciate your support. And as always, thanks for listening.